Good evening. There we are, Richard, uh, yeah, you take your seat. Well, welcome everyone again, and particularly a welcome to those who live outside of West Somerset. Welcome to West Somerset itself. And a special welcome to our Police and Crime Commissioner, Sue Man Stevens, to our Chief Constable, Nick Gargan, and our Chief Superintendent for Somerset, the current county plus North Somerset, uh, which is uh, Nikki uh, Watson. So Nikki, welcome to you, welcome to you, Sue, and welcome to you, uh, Nick. We're very pleased to see all three of you here and to see a, a large number of people coming to listen and then ask questions and make comments. So we are very pleased to see the high profile of our Police and Crime Commissioner, to listen to Nick Gargan, who we hear from time to time on BBC Somerset, and a particular welcome to Nikki Watson, who's more of our local person in, in Somerset. So we have got the top team here tonight and a chance to ask the questions and make comments. We know that we have special issues in West Somerset. We have the highest average age of any local authority in England, and that causes problems, as does our sparsity and large size and extreme rurality in parts of West Somerset, with two-thirds of the Exmoor National Park being in West Somerset and a large part of the Quantock Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. And of course, we, uh, we have the coast. And if we look at West Somerset, or most of it geographically, uh, we have the two roads uh, from Taunton, the A358, the A39 from Bridgewater, to this part of West Somerset at any rate. And we know that there are problems in, in uh, getting in and out of West Somerset, which does cause problems for businesses uh, arriving and, and settling, staying, and also for house building. So we have special problems to do with rurality, distance, and to some extent, some isolation from the, the west of Somerset. We're also the smallest uh, district council in England by population. Um, and we, two things before I hand over on this introduction. We are going through a partnership with our neighbours, Taunton Dean Borough Council, and that partnership is working extremely well um, you know, at the moment. It's early days, but we're getting the top teams into place, and we will make savings, and we will have greater resilience and expertise for West Somerset from a larger uh, management team. And the other challenge which faces at us, if it comes off, is Hinkley Point, uh, where uh, we, if, well, as West Somerset Council, are the host district council and the planning authority, uh, with a huge amount of responsibility for getting this project underway if the European Commission uh, say OK and if EDF then make the investment decision. That's big. Uh, it's important nationally, and of course for West Somerset communities, it's very important both that we mitigate any negative uh, impact, but also we take advantage of all the extra monies coming in, community benefit, and all the jobs and so on that may come into this area. So those are the two issues that face West Somerset, but I'm now going to hand you over to Sue Mount Stevens uh, for this evening. Thank you very so, much. I don't think I need that, do I? Toby needs that. Thank you. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Tim, very much. And also thank you to the Town Council who've um, promoted this event. Uh, that's been really helpful. Can I, first of all, do the fire exits? I love doing this. It's a bit like being an air steward, isn't it? But, no, uh, there's one behind me, I'm told. The one that, by the door that we came in, and I think there's one, Becky, am I right, to the, out there and to the right? Okay, but there isn't uh, one that we're, we, it won't be a practice if we get, uh, if, if the, something goes off and uh, we will all leave uh, extremely quickly, no doubt. But first of all, thank you all so much for coming. Great number of you here today and uh, that is a, you know, a marvellous, marvellous sight for, uh, for, my, for our eyes um, because it just shows you that there is a real interest in what is going on in the constabulary, what is going on as far as the PCC is concerned uh, in, in West Somerset. Um, I'm very pleased to be back in Minehead. I've spent a, an exciting day this afternoon out with um, Exmoor Search and Rescue. I've also been talking with um, various rangers from the National Park about um, wildlife crime 
and, uh, and rural crime. So I've had a real grounding in, uh, in some of the issues that we may well talk about later on today. I'd also like to thank the Beach Hotel for hosting this, this evening's forum. For those of you who don't know, this hotel is currently undergoing extensive refurbishment. It's part of the wider YMCA vision to have the venue and restaurant run by young people, some of whom are, are, are here with us tonight. I think this is an amazing initiative to teaching young people new skills and looking forward to coming back when it's complete, although can we make it sure it's a bit warmer next time? Um, my main priority and why we're here this evening is to hear from you about the issues, however big or small, that affect you in the community. And the areas I plan to cover are about myself and my role as uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, being your voice in policing and how we can work together to make our communities safer. So, Alongside with us, I have the Chief Constable, Nick Gargan, and Chief Superintendent, Nikki Watson. And between us, when we've, when we've all said a few words, then we will be opening to uh, have any questions that you want to um, offer from the floor. First of all, let me just tell you a bit about myself. I'm an I was an independent candidate. Um, I've never stood for anything before in my life. Uh, I, was, uh, I was part of a bakery business for 25 years. I was a... Um, a magistrate for 15 years on the youth, adult and, uh, and family bench and I was part of the um, monitoring board at Bristol Prison and on the police authority for the last two years before it was disbanded. So as you can see I have a real interest in the criminal justice system and uh, I w it was very clear that when this job came up and I, I felt that it was basically a very public job application that I did was that um, policing is a tough enough role without having a party politician having oversight of it. And luckily 125,000 of you also agreed with that and if any of those in the room did vote for me, thank you very much. But what the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner is not, I am not operational and I am not the Chief Constable. Pretty obviously, I don't look anything like Nick, but uh, it is, uh, he has complete uh, command and control over all his officers and his staff. But my responsibility is to appoint the Chief Constable and hold him to account, to set the police and crime plan based on local priorities, and to set the police part of the council tax precept. Now, um, I took the decision last month that I was going to raise the council tax precept by 1.99%. I've been out to consult with over 3,000 people over uh, last summer, and it was very clear that over 75% said that they were prepared to pay a little more for their police because it's something that's obviously very important to them, and with the cutbacks that are um, coming out from central government, that we are going to be a smaller force, we are going to have less money. Um, however, to go for more than a 2% for those uh, in the room that know about the uh, referendum cut, cap is that anything over 2% would be would need a referendum and I was not prepared to gamble a million pounds of your money to find out whether or not everyone wants to pay or not. That's not to say I'm ruling it out in the coming years, I'm not ruling it out because it depends on what happens over this coming year, but I felt that 1.99% uh, was as much as we could afford this time. I'm also responsible for commissioning safety, community safety services, and so Safer Somerset will, from April, receive double the amount that they received last year, and that will be over £350,000, which will be given to community safety grants, which will be um, handled by the community safety partnerships in Somerset. I'm looking at this year's project bids, and there's some really exciting initiatives, which once we've gone through those, we'll explain a bit more. But tonight I just would like to highlight two areas about my role which I think are important. One, I'm very much your voice. I am the public voice and I'm here to connect your views with, and with the police and the wider partners, acting very much as a bridge between what the, what the public want to have a direct say as into policing. And one of the things, reasons I think police and crime commissioners are working, and I would say this, wouldn't I, being one, is that uh, I replaced the police authority. In the last year, the police authority had just over 250 people who contacted me, who contacted them. I've already had over 5,000 people. And the cynics amongst you may say, I bet they're all complaints. No, they're not. But there is a real interest 
from people, and I think that the number of you that are here today actually reflect that, actually that want to give feedback into the police service because how can we, so that we can improve the police service. That's what we are trying to do. And, and I think having so many people who are taking the time to email, to write, to phone, and to attend public forums such as this, I believe that there is a real need to listen very carefully to, um, to local people. And I'm also very keen on, talk, on making sure that I listen to local people that aren't used to shouting, uh, what I call the quiet voices, to people who don't know how to lobby people like me, so not necessarily all the big organisations, but the smaller organisations, to people who don't maybe not even come to meetings like this. Uh, so I, go, I spend one day a week out listening to those, meeting those in the community. So I was at Willerton last week with some of the uh, members of the Somerset Badger Group to listen to discuss their concerns on wildlife crime. I then did a community drop-in session um, in Priors Wood in Taunton. I visited um, a housing association to listen about how they're tackling some of those, the, the issues. I visited a women's refuge and spoke to some of those where, where victims of domestic abuse have been forced out of their home to, to feel safe, especially with their children. And in the evening, I attended a parish council meeting in street where I listened again to what local people want in their local areas. Um, it's very important to me that local people have the chance and to make sure that they're, they're the issues that they want to raise that we take on board. Um, and by working together, as Tim said earlier, it's only by working together with the police, with the councils, with other statutory organisations, voluntary organisations, charities, local groups, can we make sure that your concern is something that we take, we take on board. The Police and Crime Plan was published last year with, um, together with six local plans. And this year we're going further and offering nine local plans. So for all the local authority areas which reflect the partnership working that we think is so important uh, for the police and local authorities, that we will be doing a West Somerset um, um, police and crime plan, which is just going through its final drafts at the moment. The priorities in the plan remain unchanged and we'll continue to focus on the things that matter most to you. You tell me that reducing the impact of antisocial behaviour is absolutely key. You tell me that tackling domestic and sexual violence, particularly violence towards women and children, are important. Preventing and reducing burglary and the fear of burglary in your area, and putting victims at the heart of the community, at the criminal justice system. I've also launched an action fund where I put 200,000 into where local organisation and charities and smaller groups can actually apply for uh, a small grant up to £5,000 where you tell me that there are some very creative and innovative ideas and all for a want of small amount of money that you can get up and running and we now have that, um, we, we now have that action fund. And local groups in Somerset have been benefited from over £21,000 and the money has gone to projects raising awareness of doorstep burglaries amongst older people and working with young people. And in fact, in Minehead, um, we gave a grant of £4,000 uh, to work with, uh, to help an organisation work with drug addiction and young people. So you can see, I really want to get the money going down to as, as, uh, as local an area as possible. Another focus for me is championing the voice of victims, and this will be particularly important over this next year, because I will be responsible for commissioning local victim support. I'm very clear that uh, victim satisfaction and looking after victims is absolutely key. We can do better. We either, um, we either over contact victims or we don't contact them at all. We have to be far more consistent on working with uh, and victims and making sure that we look after them from the time that they report a crime until the time that they either go through the criminal justice system, but of course some may not go through that, and giving them that, that support as well. One of the issues that we may well talk about is road safety. This has been particularly, um, uh, I've had many contacts from um, West Somerset residents about how we can work together with road safety. Uh, I'm very keen on promote, promoting community speed watch and all the other watches that there are in the area. So uh, neighborhood watch and the packed groups. Um, I know in Minehead, we've got an active pub watch and, and shop watch um, and, and how we can work together because working with um, 
the, the local authority and, and working with organizations such, such as the independent advisory groups. I know we've got, some, we've got some of those people here today and street pastors and any other group. We can't do it by ourselves. It's only by working together can we actually tackle this. So empowering groups, empowering in whichever way you think in your communities work, I'm very committed to working alongside, alongside with you. Um, we've also set up a, an independent residence panel where volunteers can, in the community, can actually look at police complaints. Some of you will know that from the national papers that integrity is a real issue, for, uh, particularly in certain areas in the country. And uh, I believe that um, letting people in and seeing how the police deal with complaints just shows that we're not hiding behind closed doors, that we are opening the doors to local people to come and see what the constabulary are doing. And I think that in a very short space of time, they've already made a difference looking at the language and tone of how we respond. I've also set up a rural crime forum to reduce the impact of crime on our local businesses. And again, if you want to know more, please visit um, the, the, um, the website. And along with 19 other PCCs across England and Wales, we're now part of a national rural crime forum in make sure that we look at, at ways that we can improve uh, rural crime, um, the, the ways of tackling it, because we've got to learn from other uh, best practices around the country. Um, so that's a quick gallop through what I have done and what I am trying to do. It's only by speaking and listening to you can I be truly representative of to be your PCC? As I say, I'm only as good as PCC as with the information you give me. All right, so please feel free to access me in any way you like after, you know, through websites, through um, email and everything else. Um, and please give me information. If you don't tell me stuff, there really is nothing I can do. Okay, so please be, um, I'm sure I don't need to ask you to be open and honest because we do need to work together. So if you have been, thank you for listening. Nick, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Nick Gargan, Chief Constable. Um, I'm used to doing this standing up, actually. I, I, I'm itching to, to stand up. Oh, go on, I'll stand up. Um, I need to hold this, though. Um, can, oh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay, jolly good. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't come naturally to me to sit down. Do we need to shift the angle? Of... Okay, sorry. Um, it's a very emotional evening for me, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to tell you. Um, I am a, a season ticket holder at Leicester City Football Club. They're at home tonight against Yeovil. <laughs> Whoever put this in the diary, I can't believe it. The, the, the car got to the junction at Gordano and it was, the steering wheel was tugging to the left. Uh, but the magnetic pull of your interest in policing was all that it took to, uh, to, to, to drag rightly. me this way. Um, and, and I'm delighted to be here. But if I appear distracted, I do have a score update service primed. Uh, thank goodness for the Beach Hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, it's been a great season to be a Leicester City supporter. Not such a good season to be a Yeovil supporter, I must say. Uh, but but um, that aside, I genuinely do appreciate your interest. I remember in the days of police authorities turning up to what were they called, Section 104 committee meetings when I was a, 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 a chief superintendent in Leicester. And um, I'd sit down there and uh, think, oh, well, at least three people had turned up. Unfortunately, one of them was the caretaker for the hall we were in, and the other two were the chair and vice chair of the police authority. Uh, so um, you know, it's great to have this conversation and to have an interaction uh, with you. Uh, I thought I'd just briefly talk you through the four things that pop into my head when I wake up in the middle of the night or at least the four things that have any relevance to you um, that, that, that pop in, into our head in the middle of the night. Um, I'll, I'd stop, I'd stop there. I'll you're, spare. Dig, you're, you're digging a hole here. I'll spare the others. <laughs> <laughs> the first of them is money. And, and Sue's mentioned the financial situation in which the constabulary and the police service generally finds itself. I happen to have the national responsibility for finance and resources. Uh, individual chiefs uh, many of us take on an additional national role over and above our local role as chief. Um, the, the guy in Merseyside, he was at the front of the queue when they dished out the sexy jobs. He got crime business area. Uh, the woman who runs Surrey Police, she got uniform operations business area. 
sadly I was in, in the car park talking to, to a mate at the time and by the time I come back in all there was left was finance and resources uh, but it, uh, it does give me an insight into uh, the way the service is, is being treated um, financially and the challenges that we face <clears throat> and just a couple of observations on that number one this constabulary by the end of the 1718 financial year will have had a real terms 27 percent reduction in its resourcing compared to the position at the end of the 10 11 financial year and i suspect one of the things that may happen this evening is you may ask a few questions about relative policing priorities and why we aren't doing more of some things it, it could be that you won't but I suspect you may. Uh, and I just ask you if we can frame the conversation in the context of that fairly sobering statistic. 27%. And actually, you know, we've not even got it worst. I was talking to a chief constable of a much larger force uh, the other day. He's done some analysis and he thinks the figure for him is 40%. Um, and, and so, you know, these are very, very sobering figures. Uh, and I've, I like the, uh, the, the words of. Uh, Professor Ian Kennedy, who is in health regulation, who said, this conversation shouldn't be about cuts. This conversation should be about the service we can provide to patients, in his case, victims in ours, the service we can provide to patients for different sums of money. And, and as Chief Constable, I will do my best with the cash I'm given, but if 27% is coming out in real terms in the resourcing, that just sets a framework. And you know, I'm very proud to lead this constabulary, it's full of outstanding men and women. Confidence and satisfaction in it is higher than in other police forces, and it performs very well. But, you know, miracle workers, we are not. Uh, and we do our best, and we need to be determined to improve, but that's the context. Number one, finance. Number two is performance. You know, we've been an improving police force. My predecessor, Colin Port, came here in, uh, in a, at a time when if somebody had come to me, I was, a, I was a chief superintendent in Leicester at the time, if somebody had come to me in 2005 and said, name the five police forces in the country that are struggling the most, I could guarantee you that Avon and Somerset would have been on my list and virtually everybody else's. As it happens, alongside Nottinghamshire, Humberside, Cambridgeshire, and the jury would be out on who the other one was. Uh, the, a few contenders. Um, but David and Somerset would without doubt have been on that list. Now, by the time he left last year, it would have been on nobody's list. He arrived at a time when the constabulary was recording 175,000 offences each year and was detecting about one-sixth of them. He left at a time when we were recording fewer than 100,000 offences each year and detecting a third of them. So the progress had been immense. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, that's not an excuse to say and things can't continue. Uh, you know, we, we will do our best to continue to improve that performance. And Nikki will talk you through a local picture of how we're doing in Somerset. I won't steal her thunder. Um, but we also need to respond to new emergent forms of crime. Because actually, you know, some crime has clearly shifted your car's less likely to be broken into, your house is less likely to be broken into, you are less likely to be robbed in the street, and your car's less likely to be stolen. But you're much more likely to become a victim of somebody attacking you and your finances through your computer, stealing your identity, and there are other forms of traditionally hidden criminality that we're getting better at dealing with and we're working <coughs> harder to uncover. Whether that's child sexual exploitation, modern slavery, female genital mutilation, serious sexual assaults, or indeed domestic abuse, which is uh, present in our community to, a, a, to a, a worrying degree. So we're trying to trading off the old police performance against a new, a new way of thinking about police performance. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we're working hard to do is to maintain the confidence of our communities. I say it's traditionally high, but we want to get it higher. And of course, we're not helped every time you have an incident coming out invariably from somewhere else, but not exclusively from somewhere else. You know, one bad incident gives you a big knock, and then, you know, hundreds of men and women each have to incrementally creep back up to, to re restore the confidence in the constabulary that we lose in some of these national cause celebre that we have been hearing about, frankly, too often recently. And then the final thing about organisational performance is, of course, just events, you know, things happen, murders happen, areas flood, 
badgicles are imposed upon us. People decide we're going to open big nuclear power stations, and, and there are policing implications for all of these things. They're just events, and there's no point us bleating about it. We've just got to get on with doing our job and doing it as well as we can. And it's just maintaining the kind of battle rhythm of a police force and dealing with all of those things is the second thing that pops into my head when I wake up in the middle of the night. The third thing is developing the organization. Now, part of that's about a new technology strategy. You know, how do we how do we keep up with fantastic advances in technology that can really revolutionise the way that uh, we do our job, and yet in the context of a police service that is really quite a bad customer, where fragmented customers, individual chief constables forget that actually in the greater scheme of things we're pretty small beer, um, and think you know we we tend to think we're more important than we are. If you look at that, there's a, the Guardian each year do a beautiful big bubble chart of where public expenditure is going, £691 billion pounds of public spending, where this tiny dot halfway down on the right, that we represent the, the police service in total, 0.81% of public spending. And yet you see, you know, chiefs, they, they do think, some of them, not, not me of course, uh, but uh, some of them do think they are, uh, they are the big I am. And we need to remember we're small customers and we need to club together and use technology intelligently. Estate strategy, I've got, we may even talk about buildings this evening, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, I've got a lot of big buildings uh, that are far, far bigger than we need and they really are terribly expensive to own. Minehead Police Station, 1,154 <laughs> square metres of floor space and the people in there just rattle around in it. You know, and that's an expense. And so the, the organisation development needs to take into account the balance between, on the one hand, paying for people, and on the other hand, paying for buildings to put them in and cars for them to drive round. And we need to get that balance right. I favour having more people and smaller, more modern, more efficient buildings. You may have a view, uh, we can discuss that. I'll be very keen to hear. And then the final thing about organisational development is some work about the operating model, as we call it. How do we deliver our services? And in May last year, we sat down as a chief officer team and decided that it was time to take a fresh look at the way we delivered services because some of them hadn't been looked at for quite some time. And so we found the best person we could find, one of our most able senior chief superintendents, Sarah Crew, and we said to Sarah, go and find yourself a team of the best people you can find and look at the way you deliver our services and then come back and make some proposals about how we might do it. I put two conditions on that. The first was, Sarah, you really must make sure that you take the organisation with you, that you listen to people and that you let them know what's going on and you ask for their views and you get their diagnosis of the problems we're trying to solve. And the second thing is, don't come back with opinion that isn't backed up by evidence. Please come back and tell us, this is what we're going to change and this is why, and this is where it's been shown to work. Or if it hasn't been shown to work, you know, let's test it and test that it works. So that it has, there's an evidence base for change rather than just some strong opinion. Uh, and I think what she's come back with is very impressive. It seems to have a, a lot of support within the organisation. The changes will be taking effect over the next few months. In part, we are driven by the fact that you know, I've inherited, for example, three very big new PFI custody sites. We'll be opening 36 cells at Bridgewater uh, in not many weeks' time, 48 cells at Canesham, 48 cells at Patchway. We've got to close a few cells down to, to, uh, to, to make ourselves uh, something other than a sort of candidate to be a prison business. Um, and, and we're going to, going to be doing that too. Um, and, and I think that the work that Sarah Crew and her team has done is fantastic. The biggest single change we'll see is that there's about 1,000 people in this constabulary who have been lulled into uh, the false sense that they are somehow immune from direct contact with the public they serve. They tend to work in little squads and far too many of them go home at about 4 o'clock, which is good for the viewing figures of Countdown, bad for you. Um, and what we're saying to some of those people is that you know, we need to just change the, way we, change the way we operate. There'll be more late shifts, there'll be more people who will feel part of the front line um, and, and will, be, will be there to be called on. So instead of having a beleaguered response function, a very thin, thin blue line that turns up to incident after incident on a rather grey and drizzly evening like this, simply to gather some details and pass the information into the system 
so that two or three days later somebody from a, a, a squad can go along and, and see the victim or the person who contacted us, you'll see the person you need to see on the day that you ring in and as often as not we'll be able to deal with incidents in their entirety on that day because the expertise is there rather than having a sort of bureaucratic system that's pushing incidents around the inside of, uh, of, of the police service. And we're confident that that will make uh, a difference. As I said, we're only doing things that are either evidence-based or trialled, and this is being trialled in South Gloucestershire as I speak. And what we're finding there, Inspector Andy Workman is about to retire, but uh, he's, he's still Inspector in South Gloucestershire. He describes turning up to work uh, late one, uh, on a late shift one Wednesday, where he's used to briefing 12 officers at, uh, when, he goes to, uh, when he goes to a late shift. Suddenly all these people who are now at his disposal, the neighbourhood people, others from the uh, intelligence function, etc., suddenly he's got 43 people available to him rather than 12. That's precisely what, uh, what I want to see. And so that organisational development will continue. The savings plan, from my perspective, is that we'll do this modernisation first, then the next couple of years we'll go into an area, a, a time when we focus very much on collaboration, uh, either with other police forces or with local authorities, and, and, and Tim and I were just talking about the potential for doing that uh, down here in the way that we're already working with Mendip, uh, North Somerset <coughs> and, and others. And then the third phase uh, will be looking at the developments as we reach the end of our relationship with South West One and uh, the, the collaboration with Taunton Dean, Somerset County Council and IBM, which, uh, which I should say has its critics, but as a relative and an entirely independent person, I think there's a lot more good about that than, than bad, actually, and it's delivered against a lot of its targets and, um, indeed, the procurement side of South West One, just as an example, passed its savings target recently two-thirds of the way through the contract, it, it had already exceeded its entire savings target. The final area for me, the final area of four, behind money, performance and organisational development, is about the culture of the organisation. And uh, police, people have been talking about police culture. In fact, I studied it at university in the 1980s. And it, of course, giant strides have been made in police culture since that time. But still, there's, there's more to do. Um, I am forever, if Sue had a pound for every time she's heard me talk about Sir Ronnie Flanagan, uh, she, would, uh, she, she wouldn't be here, I'm sure. But uh, Sir Ronnie Flanagan, you may remember him. He was the boss of the Royal Ulster Constabulary and then went off to be Chief Inspector of Constabulary uh, for Tony Blair. And um, he was asked to do a report by the, the then Home Secretary, I think it was Jackie Smith, uh, and he published his report in 2008. And it was all about what needs to change in policing. And he took us through technology, and he talked about the workforce, and he talked about collaboration, and he talked about uh, all manner of other things. And then he got to the very end of his report, paragraph 7.69, in case you're interested, and, and he said, and he, he talked a little bit about police authorities, but he said basically the one thing that we could do that would improve policing and confidence in policing is to drive up the quality of individual interactions between individual members of a police service, be they officers, PCSOs, or anyone else, and individual members of the communities they serve. And that, for me, has, that, that struck a chord with me in 2008 and has never left me, driving up the individual interactions between the police and the public. And I think we do that by, uh, by the messages we give to officers. We do that by our openness as an organisation. We do that by people in leadership positions in policing being open to criticism. And if people criticise us, our opening position needs to be, maybe this person's got a point, rather than how do we prove them wrong. Um, and just being transparent, you know, whatever, I, I was persuaded uh, against my better judgment two years ago to start using Twitter because people said, well, actually, that might be, and I, I say, there, there may be people in the room who don't use it. I recommend it. It's, uh, it's got a lot to commend it. But through the internet, through a better website, we've just opened up a new website for the force. It's, it's much better than, than its predecessor. Through public engagement and events like this, whatever it is, you know, just through talking to the press more openly, you know, an open police force is a good police force. Um, and I shall finish just by saying what, what I say to officers. Um, and, and, you know, there's officers in the room. I'm saying it to them now. Um, there are three things that matter to me from our staff. And the first of them is that they behave with integrity. Um, you have to act with integrity. Without integrity, a police service 
is nothing. And um, I remember Sir David O'Dowd, another Chief Inspector of Constabulary, wrote this big report on, on integrity in 1999. And he began with the phrase, there can be no more basic requirement of a member of a police service than that they are honest and act with integrity. And that's the first thing I say to people. The second is, you've just got to work hard. You know, sometimes it's boring and sometimes it's unpleasant. And actually there will be people starting late shifts in this force this evening who'll be feeling a little bit grumpy about it. And they'll look at the queue of incidents they're about to go to. And they'll know that actually of all the addresses they're going to, they've probably been to everyone before. And they'll be seeing people, some of whom are really quite difficult to help and not all of whom are guaranteed to be either polite or grateful. This is difficult. But, you know, the people who join this job, they do it. You know, we recruited back in May, and we had 4,000 applicants for about 150 vacancies. So 96% of people were not accepted. Those who are accepted, you know, it is a privilege to do this job. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine. Pack up, go and do something else. But it's a privilege to do it, but we should do it to the very highest standard. The organization's values talk about doing today's work today, and that's what I ask people to do. Work hard, stick in, and do your best. And then the third thing, and I'm going to stop after this, that I say to people is, you know, we've got to treat people fairly and with respect. And that means talking to members of the public in straightforward English that they're going to understand, not using any of this jargon nonsense about a male person in the premise and all that motor vehicle baloney public house crap that the police have been talking for years. Just talking to people in straightforward English and treating them fairly and with respect and you know, treating victims and anybody, even the ungrateful people, as you would want your own family to be treated. And my message to our operational staff is if you act with integrity, work hard, treat people fairly and with respect, you won't go far wrong with me. Um, I've overrun a little bit, but I've been enjoying myself. Sorry, I'm going to pass over to Nikki Watson, who is the uh, the local commander. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they kick okay. off in two minutes. Disqualified. <laughs> Nikki. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm, uh, as everybody has said, Nikki Watson. I'm the local commander for Somerset. I'm going to give you a bit of a flavour about the work that's going on locally and some of our achievements and what we've been doing to make the area a safer area. So um, if we have the first slide, fantastic. Right, um, so the Somerset area is divided into three local policing areas. And this area is what we call Somerset West, policing, local policing area, but encompasses the local authorities of Sedgemoor, Taunton Dean, and West Somerset. The, um, the local policing commander, I believe, is at the back of the room, Paul Mogg. Do you want to just stand up? Paul joined us in January, so you may not all know him, but uh, he covers this area and works in this area every day. Okay, so um, we benefit from living in a very safe area here, even compared to other very similar rural areas around the country, um, we are much safer. And that is because the local police officers, the community uh, support officers, work really closely with residents, business owners, members of the community to uh, achieve some really impressive results in not only reducing crime, but also bringing those who commit crime to justice. So in the last five years, we've reduced crime so much so that there are 3,000 fewer victims in the West Somerset West area. Um, bringing uh, offenders to justice, putting them in front of the courts, giving them tickets or giving them cautions. Uh, we're, we're achieving at the moment a 40% detection rate compared to what was 30% five years ago. Um, and the hard figures are important, but actually um, much, much more nowadays. And what's really important to me is that we are delivering a good service. We are meeting the expectations of the people that demand the service from us. And so we, uh, we measure how satisfied our customers and our victims are. So um, as you can see from the slide, the, the victim satisfaction for people that have experienced crime is at over 90% for this area, and for antisocial behavior, 83%. Um, but we can, we can do better, and we're striving to continually improve the whole time. And Sue has set us the target to get our satisfaction for antisocial behavior victims 
similar and on a par to those of crime victims. So there's lots of lots of work that we still are um, working towards. Um, Nick has mentioned um, some of our buildings. Uh, the picture on the slide is a picture of Express Park at Bridgewater, which is one of our new um, PFI buildings, which will have a large custody. This uh, this building at Express Park will support uh, the local policing that takes place in Minehead and surrounding area, um, and it will complement what we have in Minehead. So we will still have response officers, patrol officers, and neighbourhood beat managers, PCSOs working in Minehead and the surrounding areas. But um, can you just go to the next slide? Okay, right, sorry. Your slides are slightly different to mine. That's okay. Uh, so what will be at Express Park will be some of our specialist resources, um, our custody, as I said, and the neighbourhood and patrol resources that cover the Bridgewater area and the Burnham area. Um, and we hope that we'll be opening it. Certainly the custody should start there from the summertime. So um, it's not that many more months and it will be open. Right, so um, Sue talked to you about the uh, priorities that she has set us, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of information around some of those priorities um, as to what is going on locally. So if we look at uh, domestic violence, um, if you read lots of reports, um, it, we, are, we are told, that, and I believe, that domestic violence and sexual um, assaults are underreported. People don't have the confidence to come forward and tell people what they've experienced and what they've been through. So Sue has set us the target, the ambition, to increase the number of reports for, from domestic <coughs> abuse victims and from sexual offence victims. And uh, over the last four years in this area, we've increased the reporting for domestic abuse by 20% and for sexual offences by 40%. So we, uh, by working with local people, with communities, and giving training to our officers, we're able to give those victims the confidence to be able to come forward, tell us what's happened so that we can investigate. Um, we also do a lot of uh, work in, in respect of trying to prevent and reduce those sort of crimes from actually happening. So we're doing work in schools and academies, certainly to improve and support children affected, but also and making people aware of their responsibilities, what's right and wrong, and the way that they should behave. Okay. Um, Antisocial behaviour, that's another area that's a priority that communities have told Sue is important. So for this area, we've reduced the reports of antisocial behaviour by 15% in the last three years. 15%, what does that mean? It's actually 76 fewer victims per month in the west, west of Somerset compared to three years ago. And the way, the way that we've done that, we, we can't do it alone, but we've worked with local communities, with partner agencies, really important partners when we come to add social behaviour, people like the social landlords, housing authorities, local authorities, trading standards, licensing authorities. Um, we've um, had several sort of what we would call crack house closures, sounds very grand premises where there's lots of drug, drug dealing going on. We've closed them down, in, certainly in Bridgewater and the Taunton areas. Um, we've been effective in the use of antisocial behaviour orders and contracts, and the government is bringing out a new suite of, um, sort of measures and controls that we can use for antisocial behaviour that we should get later this year, and we will certainly explore the use of those. And certainly very locally, uh, Charlie Fitzpatrick, who's one of the local officers in this area, arranged the funding and arranged for a theatre company to come down to the local college and give input to 450 students around the safe use of alcohol and um, antisocial behaviour. I know that went down extremely well. So um, we're really working hard to reduce the impact of the most persistent and the nuisance offenders in the communities, but we certainly rely on people telling us what's happened so that we can work with them to tackle it. The next area I was going to talk about was burglary. Um, over the last five years, in this area of Somerset, we've got 1,000 fewer victims of burglary. That's domestic burglary and commercial burglary into businesses, um, shops. So uh, that's a significant reduction. Um, 
And even, even since uh, the start of the year, 200 less victims in this area of Somerset. So um, to give you a bit more sp a specific, there was a ser series of burglaries in the Wellington area where we arrested the suspect. And the way that we did that was we tracked, we had some, an electronic device, a phone or an iPad, that type of thing stolen. And you can, um, you can turn on a tracker and find out where those devices are. So we used, we're using the modern technology to help us in our fight against crime and, and, and finding the people that are committing the crime. The satisfaction rate for victims of domestic burglary currently standing at 93% uh, this year, but um, this, you know, we, we want to get to that 100% satisfaction, so we're still working really hard, and we, the surveys that we get back from our victims, we look at the verbatim comments and we feed them back to the officers that have attended, and we use that to improve our service and train and develop our officers. Um, there's lots of specific plans in respect of burglary, um, and particularly we target the hotspots. So we we uh, we monitor where and analyse where the burglaries are happening, and we target operations into those areas. Okay. So um, as I, I've already mentioned, we police by consent, but we certainly do not police alone. We are absolutely 100% reliant on communities and partners working with us so that we can achieve the results that we all want to make our areas safer. So giving you a few examples of some of the partnership working that's going on locally, the Rural Crime Initiative, I know Sue mentioned that, um, looking at uh, isolated rural communities and businesses and reducing the crime that's, uh, that they, they may be subjected to. Uh, family focused projects, those are projects where we give intensive support with uh, partners and, and uh, other organisations to families where members may be involved in crime or antisocial behaviour. Uh, the Somerset and Avon Rape and Sexual Support Service was launched in Taunton recently and there's a really vibrant domestic abuse forum uh, in the Taunton area but it covers the wider West Somerset area and that's been recognised as best practice and, and the rest of the force are modelling their support on that particular initiative. And, of course, the huge numbers of volunteers that help us and work with us. Um, we've got all sorts of watch programs, uh, the CCTV monitoring operation, of which Minehead is award-winning. I think some of them may be here tonight. Uh, cadet program, victim advocacy, speed watch schemes, volunteers absolutely support my officers day in, day out, and the, the PCSOs, and do a really fantastic job. Um, we have got a, 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 a renowned project that's going on in the west of Somerset. Uh, we call it the Hulk and Wom team. It's a partnership project where um, my staff work with the uh, local council, the county council, social workers, certainly social landlords, the college, um, all sorts of people to come together and work in a specific geography where there are, there are problems, certainly with uh, perhaps drug and alcohol abuse, crime, unemployment, all sorts of um, issues where the families need support. Uh, they are families that may be being worked with, all, with all those different agencies, and actually they could have visits from several of those agencies in the past, all on one day, none of it coordinated or linked, can be quite confusing for the family, and actually the support wasn't as effective as it could be because it wasn't joined up. So we're working with the other agencies to give joined up mentoring, coaching, support to those families to improve the outcomes of the adults, but really importantly, the children in those families. Um, we've already heard about um, the Hinkley Point nuclear build, um, it's a really significant infrastructure project. will be uh, the largest building site in Europe, I think, when it actually is in full swing. We'll bring in a number of, well, a significant number of workers, um, 25,000 over the sort of 10 year period of the build, but at any one time could be up to 10,000 workers. Lots of HGV, sorry, that's lorries, <laughs> lorry <laughs> movements. Um, and uh, of course, that will create congestion potentially, it would potentially lots of other issues. It's good for the area, and what we're doing is working with partners and communities to reduce any negative impacts that it might have so that we can make the most of the benefits. Okay, I think that's it. And I know that uh, we're going to invite some questions soon.
Thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you for, uh, for, for, for listening to us. I think uh, it's now very much now for you to ask us questions uh, about anything that you, you like, any, any uh, burning issues. And we have Toby, who's standing in the middle, who will, has a mic with him. And if you could uh, wait uh, for the mic to come so that everyone can hear the question. So, uh, anyone anyone that uh, wants to ask the first question? There's always got to be a first. There's always. If you just if you just wait. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you. I live in Trinity Way there, right? If it was in the pictures, I'd be on the other side of you. <laughs> uh, I live in Trinity Way, and I'm concerned about the amount of traffic that goes into Butlins. Now, the gateway for Butlins is far too close to the roundabout. I can't turn left when I come out of Trinity Way, and I can't turn right. This is Friday night. Now, it's only one night, one day a week, you have this kind of congestion. So, I, when we had the caravan up here at one time, I went around and I suggested that they use the road down to the golf course to store and come back up the roundabout and in that way because the gateway in the Butlins is, is too close. The roundabout is congested if you want to come in from this way. So I really would like to see that altered. Equally well done. Equally, um, I would like to see a yellow box put at the bottom of for, uh, Trinity Way. But we won't get that done because it costs a lot of money to put the paint down because I've made inquiries about that. But we could have a couple of more lines because people will come over. I I'm surprised at this stage that nobody's been trapped on the railway line, to be honest with you. And on top of that, the council, they put up the big sign about the roundabout and I get people outside of my house, coaches, I've had an eight-wheeler, that's an HGV by the way, <laughs> haven't been a lorry driver, okay. uh, just a joke, that's all. Uh, go out and help them turn around, because it should be the other side. Okay, all okay. right, thank, thank you very much. Nikki, do you want to... Uh, to oh, that? am I going too fast? Sorry. No, no, I'm okay. trying to hurry in case I don't want to take the floor. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding your question and your issue, and, and certainly we do work really, really closely with the management of Butlins, and Butlins don't want to be a burden to the local community. They want us to live peacefully together and for things to work. So I don't know the exact answer, but there's some of the local officers are here tonight, so they've also heard your concerns. So we will work with the local authority, the highways and Butlins, to try and get the best result that may ease that traffic con congestion at that particular time of the week. So I, I can't give you an exact answer of what we will or won't do tonight, but we'll certainly look into that. Well, it's only about the one day a week. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's always easy to criticise. It's not always easy to come up with the answers. I've experienced that in my previous work. So. Well, you've made a couple of suggestions, That's so we'll have a look at that. Okay, well, Nick, yeah, I'd like if you'd like to... to uh, and, uh, and, uh, because some of these coaches, and I've had two quite a continental. So with that sign, should definitely be the other side. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just, I just make uh, an observation. There are a few colleagues in the uh, in the room. Some of them in uniform, some uh, some incognito. If uh, if a question gets asked that uh, you think you've got the answer to, well, you say actually we tried that two years ago and this, this worked or didn't work, uh, then by all means stick your hand up and uh, and, uh, and speak up uh, because. Uh, and certainly, you, Nikki and I will be stretched to the limit of our memory of detail of the organisation on, on some of the questions that were likely to be to be asked. So, if colleagues have got an answer, let's hear from you. Okay, thank you. Next question. Thank you. You mentioned the new building at Bridgewater, and I believe there might be a suggestion of a centralised custody block there with the possibility of mining cells closing. Now they tried this, I remember from bitter experience, in West Midlands where they built a centralised custody block at Warsaw and closed the cells at Willinghall. Now there's only about four miles in between the two, but in between is also junction 10 of the M6, which means that the travelling distance is roughly the same as it is from here to Taunton. It meant then that detections dropped, 
crime rate went up, vandalism went up, and eventually, because there were no police but on the street, they were all travelling backwards and forwards, everyone started to notice. Twelve months later, it all changed and it went back. What will be your reaction if the same thing happens again, if crime rates go up, if detections go down and vandalism goes up because of the closure, possible closure at Minehead? I think that, um, as I indicated when I was making my opening remarks, you know, we're going to end up, we're going to have more cells per officer than many police force in the world um, that, that I can see. So we would be sensible to start shutting a few down. Um, at Minehead, we're, I looked at the figures for the last couple of years, and uh, last year it was just under one custody record opened per day. This year it's been a shade over. But actually that, you know, that doesn't justify the cost of the space. So I think what we need to do is think about how we, how we mitigate the risks that you've just summarised, I think very accurately. But what's changed between now and what was probably happening in the West Mids, and I remember a bit about the West Mids because I used to be a regular visitor to Rose Road custody at, uh, at Harborne. Um, what's, what's different now is the rate at which money's going out of policing. So actually it's not a choice of whether officers are here dealing with somebody they've arrested or away at um, Bridgewater getting uh, detained people booked in. It's actually a question of whether we've got that officer or not. That's the dilemma that, uh, that I face. What we have done to build into our plan um, for these new custody centres, and again, you know, I, I inherited, I think it's a, it's a reasonably good idea, but it's, it's, not, it's not an idea I'll take any credit for, having these big consolidated custody centres. Uh, we've also built into the plan actually extra transportation that comes out to pick up the people that have been arrested at peak times and take them back to the custody office. So actually for arresting officers, in many, many cases, it'll be, um, it'll be less of a time off the streets than, than, there is, um, than there is now, and certainly at peak times. And we'll be able to anticipate when those peak times are. And of course, we, you know, we know it's seasonal here, we know it's times of the day and day of the week, we know that, um, that there are particular moments around events in relation to Butlins that we can, we can prepare for. We can have that custody transportation here ready to deal at a time of, of peak demand. But, you know, let's not be fooled into thinking that uh, Minehead Custody Office is a, is a thriving hub of, uh, of detained people. I went in there the other day. I, mean, there's not, I don't mean to be, uh, to, to be dismissive of it. it it's, this isn't, you know, the, su the measure of success in Minehead isn't going to be how many people we get locked up in policing terms. That's just, uh, it's, it's not about that here. Um, when you go in the custody office, there, literally there's copies of you know, Hillwalker magazines and things in there for, for arrested people to look at. It, it is just, it's not like a busy central Bristol nick, and, and we shouldn't pretend it is, but we should be absolutely conscious. You know, people, our officers here are good officers and they do nick people, and we need to make sure that when they're arresting people, those people can be dealt with efficiently. It's my belief that having an empty custody office here that's costing us a bomb isn't the best way of doing that. I think we also need to be very clear is that because of the savings that we have got to find and the fact that we are going to centralise custody, we cannot, afford, we cannot afford to keep very large buildings. We need, it is far more important to have officers on the street and, and then rather than large buildings. But that's not to say that we are going to be, we're not, we're going to be reducing our police presence. And in the same way as I said at the very beginning that we wanted to, that the Chief Constable and I want to be open and transparent. So we, you know, we're sharing our thoughts. We are, we believe that Minehead uh, Police Station is too big, so we will be looking at, at other properties. And as some of you will know, is that there is very early talks about working together with fire and ambulance and having a, 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 a site together on that. That has to make sense. I'm sure none of you would keep a very open a building, a very large building that's not going to be used, that could save money, that we could put that money into uh, um, into offices. And the same way as in, 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 we would have an inquiry office, which could be far more central right on the high street. We have to go to where people are, okay, and, the, and, and it, it, is, uh, it is incumbent on us as a business to make sure that we're using your money, it's taxpayers' money, and you do not, you know, taxpayers do not want a half-empty building. You want to have, you, 
tell me constantly you want more police visibility. And that's what I'm going to be working towards. <coughs> Thank you. No, I don't need to. Okay. Toby in the front here. Hello. Um, we are a very rural community here, in most part. And if you look at the cuts that you're going to have to make, or the changes you're going to have to make to policing, how will it impact on the rural community? Bearing in mind that if you should need a response time from Taunton or Bridgewater, you're looking in excess of half an hour to get an officer across. Now, there are often occasions, as, uh, as you know, for the, what I do as a volunteer, that you do experience lags in time. Is the, are the cuts going to impact on the response time that we have in West Somerset? In the end, you know, there's a the kind of basic fact I started, didn't I, with you know 27% real reduction over uh, over an eight-year period, and that's taken us from having nearly 3,400 police officers to having fewer than 2,800 police officers. Uh, so, so the starting point is we're going to have to you know, work a bit harder. Uh, we're going to have to be a bit canny, and we're going to have to think our way around that. And and so the starting point is things will get worse unless we are clever. And with the sort of things we're trying to do to be clever, I would describe some of them. It's about moving people out of offices to the front line, making people available for response. What a conversation, Nikki and I were in a meeting about this operating model yesterday morning, and we were talking about the changes that can be made by making officers deploy singly rather than in pairs. And a decision was made, actually, we'll take more from Bristol because they're less effective at working singly actually Somerset's become very effective at working singly and, and it's, it's, the, it's the norm to see officers patrolling and driving around on their own uh, and so we'll insulate Somerset from that cut because we think we can we can make more efficiencies and, and, and better working elsewhere you know, our job is to is to apply um, common sense to strike a balance between the needs of more urban communities the needs of more rural communities understanding the implications of sparsity um, and, and, and remoteness, whilst also understanding that there are certain areas where people are absolutely rushed off their feet and are running from job to job to job, which is typically not the experience of patrolling officers here. And, and that is the, uh, that's the balance that we aim to strike. Um, and obviously one of the reasons that, that we survey people for their satisfaction and confidence, etc., is so that we can find the feedback to, to know those areas where we're getting that more right than others. Um, and it's also the value of events like this, and it's why you know, our volunteers actually just from a day-to-day -day basis telling us what's working and what's not. So you know, there's no science to this. Um, the competing demands are many. Uh, we're doing our best. We need to hear where we're getting it right. But fundamentally, you know, 27% re reductions in resourcing means that you know, whilst we'll try our very best to carry that off with the minimum impact, you can't say there'll be no impact. I'll just sorry, quickly add to that. Um, with the advances of technology and computers, which generally held to be a good thing, if I go back a few, not that many years, everything we do is computerized now. And I used to go into the report writing rooms in the police station, and there would be banks of police officers at computers, not out on the street, because we asked them to put everything on the computer. <coughs> well, I'm delighted that in the last couple of months, we've just rolled out proper mobile data terminals that officers take out with them on patrol now. So even if they've got to do some paperwork, they can do it either in a victim's house or they can do it sat up at a strategic roundabout, which is a hotspot area. So they are out and about in the community. They're nearer to where it's happening rather than all sat in the police station and have to run out of the police station when something happens. So we are using technology now to be able to address some of those issues. Thank you. I think first thing I want to say is that uh, I think we're very blessed at the moment with the police coverage that we get. And I think I would like to commend that to you. My concern is, and we have to accept the 27% cuts, there is a fall, and has been a fall, in the number of police officers situated in Minehead and the surrounding areas over the last 10 years. So just over 10 years, we've had COD here. Um, so, you know, things have changed. 
What worries me, though, is this business of the central cells in Bridgewater being used if we don't have the right number of resources here. Because if we haven't got the people, all of a sudden two people are going to have to take somebody to Bridgewater. By the time they've taken them to Bridgewater, far side of Bridgewater, handed them over, done the documentation and got back, there's a good two and a half hours gone. What's happening then when there's an adult weekend at Butlins, when there's the Wellington Hotel at the top of the town, and as it is at the moment, only four policemen generally on duty. Two go. I have heard a rumour they're going to come from Tiverton, or is it Taunton, or where is it from? But that's a delay in terms of response. And what worries me is we've got nowhere to place the prisoner if you're you know, in custody, unless you take them away. And that means we are losing valuable people on the ground here. And don't forget, in the summer, our population grows about tenfold. The police resources, and that's not a dig at you, does not go up that amount. What happens is that we are, you know, it is more crime in the summer. You said yourself, Nick, it's seasonal. But we've got to have the rationale, we've got to have resources to cover that. We can't wait for somebody to come from Taunton if there's a big fight going off in the centre of Minehead. I think there are two things that you do there, and, and I accept the, the, the point and I, I see the risk. Um, which is why we did all the operating model work behind the, uh, the, the opening of the, of the custody centres. Um, but the first thing you do is plan. You know, you plan to, to have resources there at the time you need them. So more people will be doing late shifts. So the chances of there being more people on duty to provide support is going up because a, a higher proportion of a shrinking workforce will be referred to as frontline and fewer people will be home in time for countdown. That's the things I described earlier on. Um, you also plan to move your resources around more effectively in a dynamic sense. You know, in a football, in a football game, if you're, and incidentally, uh, goalless after 20 minutes, I can inform you, uh, uh, the, the wonders of modern technology. Um, in, in a football game, if one of your centre backs goes up to the to the front, to, goes up front to try and score at a at a corner, somebody else comes across and covers for them. Well, ditto here. If somebody makes an arrest and they're off up, uh, they're taking the person they've arrested up to Bridgewater. Then the control room needs to be thinking, oh, who do we move across? How do we, we how do we move the pieces around on the chessboard to ensure we've got some cover? That's just intelligent resource deployment. There isn't a box of police officers in the station we can break open and just uh, just pull another one uh, pull another one out. But you know we'll do our best to plan to have the right people in the right numbers on duty at the right time to anticipate events where it's reasonable to assume there'll be uh, there'll be greater demand to put in place arrangements like the custody collection arrangements that I just described to you so that at times of peak uh, peak demand you can actually have a van ready to come and collect the person who's been arrested rather than uh, expect arresting officers to take them up there all of those little habits all of those sensible resource deployment techniques that you know there's nothing particularly new or clever about this you know Tesco have known for years to send me when I do my online Online shop to only send me one driver um, uh, and one van with my shop rather than you know three vans just because they two wanted to come and have a look you know it, it's sensible resource deployment is, is what I'm talking about here and making the best of, of a difficult situation but the rationale for moving to smaller buildings is as I've said before you know it'll, it'll retain as far as we possibly can the number of operational officers for us to use and the pieces on this chessboard and if we keep buildings that are too big or we can't afford um, then you know the chances of pulling that off will be greatly diminished yes. uh, I'll just very quickly add to that you suggested the potential is going to be two and a half hours the, uh, the 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 people that are arrested and taken to Bridgewater there will be teams of investigators at Bridgewater and their sole job is to investigate and interview people that are arrested and brought to the station. So officers that are taking prisoners there literally will be dropping them more or less at the door and turning straight back round. They'll hardly even need to go into the building. Okay. Okay. Gentleman right at the back. I'm not sure. Gentlemen. Thank you. Could you please elaborate on the policing arrangements around the Hinkley Point development? There seem to be an awful lot of assumptions in all sorts of areas of civic life about what is happening there. But we are, do face an increase, which is not hundredfold, but thousandfold in terms of the size of that community. And the pressure on all our social services, and especially policing, is 
inevitably going to be immense. We have uh, we've been keeping a pretty close eye on on that. Uh, Sue and I have uh, have been together to visit the site at Hinkley Point. Uh, we've also been involved with, in negotiations with EDF and, and with local authorities about the likely surge in policing demand associated with, uh, with, with the development. We've already received funding for uh, a, an operational planning team and uh, I'd anticipate that a decent proportion of our costs will be met as part of, uh, part of the development. I should say, however, uh, that um, some of the consequential costs, you know, a lot of workers, perhaps, uh, you know, significant proportions of uh, uh, proportions of them being, you know, young young men with a bit of cash in their pockets uh, in our sort of towns and and pubs on uh, weekend evenings, you know, that's going to place demand on us, and I, I'm not sure we'll need to be vigilant to ensure that the extra resourcing we're getting is going to equip us to meet that challenge. The other thing is, I've seen some interesting coverage today from uh, Leicestershire where uh, the, the Chief Constable contacted me to say that his Police and Crime Commissioner, Clive Loder, has sought a judicial review of, uh, of a plan for a housing development because he thinks that the uh, requisite money, they call it Section 106 funding, to, uh, to, to, to uh, <coughs> ensure that, uh, that the, the impact of that housing development is compensated for in terms of impact on local services, um, is too little and will be arriving too late. So we'll be watching the Leicestershire case very closely um, and, and I'll do that both in my capacity as chief here, but also national lead for, for finance and resources. Um, but also we'll be keeping the pressure on, on EDF. And um, it's one of the advantages of having a police and crime commissioner. I think my role is inherently non-political and I'll simply point out the operational consequences of one or other decision. It's then for the police and crime commissioner to, to get involved with the ugly politics of it and I'll leave that to her. By the way, can I say one other thing? I have a very bad news for you, ladies and gentlemen. We've gone behind to Yeovil. <laughs> <laughs> Toby. Good evening. Um, given that in West Somerset we're far closer to Devon than we are to Bristol, and that it's easier for our local police to communicate with Brislington or Bath than it is with Bampton or Linton, would it not make economic and operational sense for us to be working on southwest policing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll start with this. Uh, there, there is, and I'm going to give you the same answer because you, you've asked a, a similar question um, earlier on today. But there, uh, as the basic answer is that there has to be much more collaboration between the five forces. The five forces being Devon and Cornwall, Avon and Somerset, Dorset. Gloucestershire and Wiltshire. And as PCCs, and I would say this, wouldn't I, I think that there has been a really good kickstart in order to get far more working that going on about how we can do much more stuff together. And that is caused by one, by making, because we've all got massive savings to, 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 um, to find. But also we can be far more effective and far more efficient because uh, we do have these borders between the, uh, the police forces, but ones that the criminals don't recognize. And it, it's beholden on us to make sure that we can deliver cross-border. I was speaking earlier to an officer, and there's, there is a good contact between, um, particularly in this area, between us and Devon and Cornwall. Uh, could it be better? Yes, it could. And we have to find ways of making sure that that communication uh, is, is very much uh, at, the, at the forefront to operationally that can, that can go on. But you're absolutely right. There has to be more and more work done on uh, creating um, uh, all, the, all the forces, particularly the five forces, working as closely together as we can um, because that is the way that we will save more save money but also we'll be able to produce and provide a much better service to, to, to local people without having very false borders which we have at the moment. I'd say um, three things. The first is that uh, what police force structures we should have, whether they're regional, sub-regional, national or local police forces, is a matter for ministers to decide, not for chief constables. I'll get on and police in whatever kind of uh, an environment they want me to police in. Um, and they might want uh, ultimately to answer the challenges that are coming down the line, the additional financial challenges. I think there'd be a very sensible model in which you could say that local police and crime commissioners are responsible for the neighborhood, 
the CID and the response functions and everything else gets aggregated up to a more more efficient economic level. Um, and as lead for finance and resources, I can tell ministers, I've told Damien Green, the police minister, what I th that I think that could save him some money. Uh, but in the end, they are political choices. Um, the second thing I think uh, it's important to say is that uh, it is important that ministers understand that it is their job to say how policing should be organised in this country because leaving it to individual chiefs is, uh, or indeed individual police and crime commissioners with no steer as to how ministers want things set up, um, you, you, you create a slightly chaotic situation uh, where you have some areas going for sub-regional collaboration, some going for cross-regional collaboration, some prefer the regional model, some the virtual, some cross-functional, some cross-sector. It's like watching a kid play with three different coloured balls of wool. It's fine as they get ever more tangled up together, provided you never want to untangle it in, in the future. But I think it's minister, minister's responsibility to say how they want policing set up in this country. And when they fail to do so, it's like asking an orchestra to conduct itself. You know, it's not, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And it's not that there's one big, very difficult thing. It's just there's a number of small, irritating, uh, if to use management speak, buggeration factors that just make it really, really hard to do. <clears throat> the third thing, and where I do accept responsibility as chief, is that it's our responsibility uh, to make sure that the, the boundaries that exist between police forces have the minimum operational impact and so that we can operate in an interoperable way uh, so that if a, if a villain is going across force boundaries or is living in force A, committing crime in, in, in force B, and then getting back to uh, look after, you know, dispose of their ill-gotten gains in force C, we're up to that and that shouldn't matter. And actually we've made huge strides over the last couple of decades in dealing with that. The police radio system, the airwave system, uh, criticised by many for being expensive, it's this massive £380 million per annum PFI uh, digital network, nevertheless it's very effective and it means that an officer from, uh, from Somerset can talk to an officer in any other force in the country through the single handset and it's been excellent technology. <coughs> Probably we've not made the best use of it but we've got it. Similarly in 2011 the police service in response to Lord Bishard's recommendation after Soham we rolled out the police national database and for the first time we linked up the intelligence system of all 43 police forces in England and Wales and Scotland and the Serious Organised Crime Agency and other partners beyond. So actually, that operational responsibility to remove the, uh, the, the, the seam and to remove the, the um, interruption to service that is inherent in a 43-4 structure, we've done quite well. Finally, of course, we rely on the goodwill, common sense, and lack of parochialism of the people on the ground to have the wit to pick up the phone to get to the nearest police station that's in the next force area, perhaps make an arrangement where they're swapping some kit, allowing each other access to their technology, arranging joint tasking across the across the border, etc., etc. And that's not something chief constable should need to tell you to do. That's just that's kind of your job if you police an area like this. Okay. Toby. Uh, good evening. I, I'm the second Leicester City supporter here tonight. Um, well, they need us up there, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a couple of questions, actually. Um, the first one is, um, you say that uh, you've got um, a plan that is coming out for the West Somerset area. Um, when are we going to be asked to contribute to it? I, I ask it as a parish councillor because uh, I've never been asked. Uh, it has it has been out in for draft consultation since uh, just after Christmas, and uh, I think the uh, I mean if you if you'd like to, to look at it, we will we will by all means have a, have a uh, we'll send it to you or we'll email it to you. In fact, uh, we've got some we've got some drafts at the back of the room, but we have we have engaged with all the community safety partnerships with the local authorities um, so that everyone can have sight of those uh, while they have been in draft. And we have taken on board a lot of comments from people wanting to improve it. I have made lots of comments, but uh, I haven't seen your plan. Okay. Well, by all means, have a look there, and uh, you can talk to uh, some of the team tonight. Um, the same thing is uh, community speed watch. Um, we've uh, been running hours for the last year. 
one of the major things that we've uh, noticed is that we're feeding a lot of information into the system, uh, but there's nothing coming back confirming uh, whether it's worthwhile information, uh, what is the success rate, um, how many people are actually being um, prosecuted or even warned. Um, so all the, all the work is being done on the ground, but there's nothing actually being fed back um, to say how well or what we need to do to avoid it. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I, I will, I will ask uh, Nick and probably Nikki to respond to that. But first of all, let me say that I'm extremely supportive of Community Speed Watch. I'm disappointed by what you're saying. Uh, there is a lot of work that's going on to make sure that we really give a good kickstart to Community Speed Watch and uh, making sure that you get that information. Communication is a, is, is a complete um, circle. As long as if you're giving information in and you're not, you're not going to get anything back, in the end we all give up because we think it's just going into a black hole. And I do not want that to happen and I know that the constabulary are looking very hard on how to make sure that information is fed back to you, that reinforces that you are making an extremely valuable contribution to, 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 to road safety. And uh, you know, I'm sure Nick will re reinforce the fact that we are, we, we, we are doing better but we're obviously not doing well enough for you to make those comments. Yeah, um, I mean, on Community Speedwatch itself, uh, we'd acknowledge that the scheme stalled locally in, uh, in 2013, uh, but now there's been a, a concerted effort more recently to retrain and reinvigorate uh, it recently. Uh, Inspector Adam Cooper is the, uh, is the person responsible for that, and uh, my headquarters colleague, Chief Inspector Jan Georgiou, although, I mean, local ownership here, uh, we've got Paul at the back, uh, he, he's ready to, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's hands, in the, he's air. hands in the air. Uh, before Paul tells you what, what's going to happen next and what's happening now, could I just say, number one, that we accept, I accept the principle uh, that, that, and Sue's principle position that it, you know, community speed watch has to be a good idea in a world where I've shrunk, or my predecessor and I have between us, shrunk the uh, traffic department. It's now called the Roads Policing Unit, but it's the same thing. We've shrunk it to about two thirds of its original size. Um, we have to get whatever help we can. That's what prompted me to say, let's get those speed cameras switched back on, uh, happy to, to talk about that. Uh, but actually, it's all there's an integrated uh, rationale to this that starts with speed watch, reaches out into education. Tomorrow, please don't, uh, if the press in the room don't publish this till tomorrow, well, I'll be in trouble, but we'll be announcing that we'll be giving free courses to any young drivers in Avon and Somerset policing area to encourage safer driving because such a high proportion of people who die on the roads of drivers between 17 and 24 will be and, and they get nothing after they pass the driving test so we'll be bringing them in and giving them paid for by the proceeds of uh, the proceeds of the of the cameras free driver awareness sessions um, for anybody who wants one um, there'll be the fixed camera enforcement I've uh, been down to the cash point I've got my few quid ready to buy the cameras back off uh, Somerset County Council and, and look forward to uh, finalising that deal we also have an increasing number of mobile detective vans bit by bit that combination of community activity police enforcement education or and of course other factors which are the responsibility of partners better road design Etc. Uh, Etc. Et you know they will come together, and I hope restart the downward momentum, uh, which we were enjoying for several years, which stalled about 2010-11, and has been plateauing since. Uh, we want to restart that downward momentum of uh, the numbers of people killed and seriously injured on our roads. But Paul, uh, Paul Mogg, the chief inspector, who is uh, who is my person to blame for this locally, is now going to tell us what's happening. <laughs> Thanks very much, my boss. Uh, if I could just um, come down the front, just so everyone doesn't um, crane your neck. Um, I knew I was going to get a walk on part in uh, this particular forum. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yep, good stuff. Um, just to underline in terms of what the boss has said, what Sue said, what Nick has said in relation to uh, Community Speedwatch, um, we recognise how important this is. Um, as a police officer, I don't think there's anything more devastating than the loss um, that a family can suffer in relation to someone who has a loved one who's been killed as, as a result of, of a speeding vehicle. Um, in terms of community speed watch, we've identified that we did have a problem in relation to the process flow, in relation to the information that uh, 
volunteers were giving to us um, out and about within the communities. Um, and basically what was happening was we were getting uh, members of the public, some as far flung as Edinburgh, Scotland, Outer Hebrides, who were writing to us to say, we've had a letter from the police to say that we've been speeding within the Somerset area. We have never ever visited Somerset. Um, what's going wrong? There's a, there's a bit of a problem in your system. And what we were identifying is that um, volunteers were taking note of registration numbers, they were putting on the forms. There is a process flow because it's Devon and Somerset Fire who help us out with the keying in relation to those particular forms that then go off, produce letters and go out to um, motorists and members of the public. Um, and basically, we were finding that we were getting a large degree of errors and there was a problem in relation to our process. So what we did was we suspended Community uh, Speed Watch, we communicated that with the organisers, um, and then what we ensured was that we've gone back, we've made sure that we've got the right data cleansing that takes place within the police station, um, and we only two days ago relaunched Community Speed Watch within uh, the Somerset West area. And what we've done is we've got um, members of our cadet force, Community Speed Watch volunteers, and indeed members of our road policing unit involved in those particular schemes. Um, and what we anticipate will happen now is there will be a high degree of accuracy and prosecution in relation to those people that are actually offending in our local areas. So we're back, um, and we're back better and more efficient than we've been in the past. Um, and certainly, in terms of my neighbourhood inspectors, one of the thrusts that we'll have locally is around dominating and pushing forward the community speed watch schemes. For this particular area, you've got four. Um, my intention is to push that forward even more, because obviously we want to give you the quality of service and ensure that you don't have speeding traffic in your communities, which is really, really important to you. So hopefully that answers one of the local questions that you may have. But happy to answer any more questions in relation to Community Speed Watch, certainly at the end. Thank you. I, I, would, I would just, um, your actual point was that it's not a one-way flow of information and you need feedback because you want to know that you're being successful. So we absolutely guarantee that we will get that to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Gentleman, just there, that you just raised your hand. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I'm a member of a the advisory independent advisory group which you created, and which hasn't been mentioned here tonight, and the importance the role it plays within relationship between the police uh, and the community, which we're trying to create a a group here for mm -hmm. this area could relate to the whole issue of the community being highlighted tonight. Uh, we feel uh, that is very important as a group from form relationship between uh, the community and the police and to bring forward all the issue concerning the community. One of the things we experience is when we visit the flood area in Bridgewater and we find that the police was guarding those properties 24 hours straight through in the rain, in the wind, and everything. And I commend that. But what I'm trying to highlight is taking this opportunity tonight and through the chair is that we are looking for a member to form in this area to be working closely with Sean in the police station as well as with Paul. And I don't know if Paul or Sean want to speak something about that because it, they play a very big role. Thank you. I'm sure one of them will. Uh, I, I've actually been updated on how um, the independent advisory group is, is uh, have got a meeting next month, I think, although I'm sure Shane will, will, will tell me in a minute, um, that uh, and I'm trying to get a specific uh, independent advisory group for this area because they are the critical friends. They are the, 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 the people who have got, you know, very grounded in their communities and feeding directly into local policing is, is absolutely key. So any, any work that we can do to, to help that, that get off the ground, we can. But does any of the, I can't see, is any, does any of the officers here want to just talk about what you're trying to do as far as the, uh, the, the meeting that's taking place in Taunton? Can I just say as chairman of the IAG that um, we've come over tonight been so war warmly welcomed with old friends and colleagues and if anybody wants to come and talk to us afterwards we're more than interested in recruiting 
Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure there is, I hope that there will be many, many people interested in that. Did any of the officers just want to talk about the IAGs? You might want to go and sit at the front, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for colleagues in relation to the independent advisory group who have, have come along tonight. Um, certainly, we'd, we'd like to use it as a bit of an opportunity as well in terms of marketing the independent advisory group, um, because as already has been said by the panel, what's really important is that we throw open the doors in relation to policing and we ensure that we get a really kind of ethical look at everything we do and, and sometimes as, as police officers and, and members of uh, police staff sometimes we don't we, we just fall into processes because that's the way we've always done things sometimes um, it's just healthy to have a different perspective to have a community aspect um, for someone to advise us or to think about have you, have you thought about doing something differently in a different way um, the independent advisory group is obviously reflective of the communities that we police um, and we're slowly picking up um, interested members who'd like to be part of that. Um, certainly I would, I would ask if there's anyone present who would very much like to be part of the independent advisory group, um, please speak to myself, Keith or Nick um, in relation to some of the embryonic stuff that we're starting to do already. Um, they were very active in, in the floods, of which I'm very thankful, gentlemen, in relation to going down to the flood zones, inspecting what the multi-agency response was, being able to comment, being able to act as a two-way conduit in relation to everything that was happening in those particular areas. Um, and certainly, um, I'm, I'm very keen to get them involved in so many other issues. For instance, legal highs um, seems to be on the increase now, certainly in the Taunton area. I'd like to get them very much involved in that. Um, because obviously that has spin-offs in relation to begging, antisocial behaviour, um, all sorts of issues that can affect communities' lives and, and how people feel about their communities. Um, I'd also like to get them very much involved in relation to stop and search and to see whether we as the police have, have, have got that right, um, the, the numbers of, of various members of the communities that are stopped and, and whether those are justified. Um, and so what the independent advisory group are going through at the moment is a familiarisation um, in relation to some of the police procedures. We're getting them involved and going along in an acquaint visit in relation to our communication centre um, at Porter's Head so as they can see the, the, the sheer number of calls that come into us on a 24-hour period. Um, and they're also going to go out on ride-alongs so as they can understand some of the dynamics in terms of how frontline police officers deal with situations and can then be able to inform the debate in terms of how we structure our business going forward. So certainly um, would very, very much appreciate anyone here who feels that they'd like to get involved in that uh, independent advisory group. Thank you. Just a, a, a two-minute quick history lesson. If, if you're sitting there thinking, what's all this independent advisory group thing? Um, that came about as a result of the, um, the Stephen Lawrence investigation and the McPherson inquiry that followed that. And, and basically it, um, the, the, the thinking went, sometimes the police don't know when they're not meeting people's needs. And so if, if uh, you've got police officers who are all white, the policing an area that's half Muslim, and you decide we're going to make some friends with the community by having a cheese and wine party, actually, that, that's quite a bad idea. Um, or, you know, we're going to, um, we're going to have a, a meeting on a Friday lunchtime. Well, actually, you know, people at the mosque want to be at the mosque on a Friday lunchtime at Friday prayers. They don't want to be in the police station. Ditto. Paul mentioned stop and search, you know. The police needed to be reminded of what's the impact like on, you know, young, as at the time it was young black kids in certain areas in London of just being stopped and searched all the time. Well, translate that into Bristol. Yes, you know, we get independent advice in and around uh, Bristol that, that is very similar. Here it's a bit different, but actually I remember coming, I don't know, one end, of a, one end of a farm vehicle from another when I came as chief constable and said, well, why don't we get together with a few farmers? And somebody said, well, don't do it next month. Why not? Well, it's harvest. You know, they're, they're busy from 5.30 in the morning till the, the last light of day. And so that's the type of advice, you know, we, we, you know, yes, bits of it are advice on professional practice, but it's members of the community saying, look, you're the police. And, and you know what you're doing, but we understand our community really well, and we can help you understand the impact of your decisions and your plans and your bright ideas on this community, because we live here and our families have been here for a long time. So that's the that's the background, and of course there there are 
even within predominantly white um, rural communities like this, there are then people from different backgrounds who can say, understand the specific impact of your policies on people from our community. So that's, that's what we have in mind. That's why we think it's a good idea to have an independent advisory group. And if you think that you have an insight that will help us un better understand the impact of our policies, then we'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you. Gentlemen here, big jumper. No. Okay. Thank you. I'm Ron Broidel, uh, town councillor in Minehead Town Council. But what do you see is the role of street pastors, and what do you consider the advantages of having them? Is well, uh, let me just kick off on that. Uh, street pastors play an absolutely vital role. I've, see, I've been out with them in, in various areas um, on a Saturday night, handing out the flip-flops, the lollipops, and the bottles of water. And I think, one, that they are a, a, uh, a group of people that people trust and feel safe. I've seen them also in uh, talking to, uh, particularly with uh, young men who are able and they're able to diffuse um, some very ag you know they can get very aggravated especially with um, having consumed too much alcohol and I've seen street pastors diffuse that into the end where everyone just gives everyone a hug and, and moves on. I was quite I was quite no I was cynical of street pastors because I'd been told what they did and I thought you know barring the fact that they almost were, have halos what how how could they affect young people on on a sat on a Friday Saturday night or or in, in, in Taunton and other nights as well. I, I have been totally persuaded. I have seen them in action, and I think they play a critical role because they are safe, they diffuse, they, dif they can diffuse so many things, and that they are also um, a very a good pair of ears to, for people to talk to who haven't been able to talk to other people, so don't, don't want to talk to the police, don't want to talk to statutory organisations, but a very safe and trusted uh, pair of ears that um, can help a lot of individuals, particularly young people on a Friday and Saturday. So I'm very supportive. We have funded quite a lot of work with that. Um, but that's not an operational answer. I'm just saying that as a police and crime commissioner, having been out with them, I've seen that they've, they've done some ex excellent work. And you've forgotten the flip-flops. And I've forgotten the flip-flops. <laughs> In fact, I, I borrowed a pair of flip-flops because I was in stupid shoes, and so I had to use them on the way. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely 100% support. Wow, what a fantastic bunch of volunteers. We can't be everywhere, and sometimes when we get tied up with things on in, during the evenings, they, they could be for a short time. The only you know person that's out on the street that's helping to keep people safe until we get back again. We The officers and the staff have built up a fantastic relationship with the volunteers that come out and act as street pastors and actually I'm aware of a lot of the street pastors who've made up relationships with people that they see regularly who are out and about enjoying themselves uh, on Friday and Saturday nights. So it works really well together. As Sue said, the young people have confidence and trust the volunteers and it's a, you know, it's a visible presence on the street that can actually help people. And absolutely, I am convinced. You know, I can't say how much crime would have been caused if they weren't there, but I'm absolutely convinced that it helps keep our community so safe and, and reduce crime. I agree with everything that's been said. I just add a, an additional point. I think one of the things that got us into such a pickle in our town and city centres a few years ago was that effectively people over the age of 30 decided that it wasn't a safe or desirable place to be and vacated the streets. And if you look at the difference between you know, continental city centres and town centres to which we aspire and ours, I think it's fundamentally that point. And I think the, town, the, the, the street pastors and others represent that incremental reclaiming of town and city centres for all. And I think that has a very positive impact on the behaviour of young people. So yes, you know, there are the, the paralytic ones who are being helped out, the ones who are getting a bit teary being given a lollipop, and the girls who can't walk anymore being given flip-flops to replace the killer heels. But I think there's just this broader good of, you know, the whole community reclaiming weekend evenings in our town centres, and it's absolutely to be, to be encouraged. So, so agreeing with everything that's been said before, I, mean, I think, I think there's, there's more to it than even that. Okay. Um, as a member of uh, my history, pastors are blushing, my hair is shining. Um, uh, 
<laughs> um, if she, I really wanted to comment on the police presence on a Saturday night in the early hours of Sunday morning in Wellington Square, which is when the London Street pastors were out. And the thing that impresses us immensely is the way in which the officers relate to the people who are enjoying themselves or not, as the case may be. Um, they try incredibly hard not to arrest them. They talk to them. They persuade them. They're cheerful. And uh, at the end of the day, I think they do a wonderful job out there in the early hours of a Sunday morning. And I'm glad that I hope that the, the powers that be will recognize that that is a peak time for Minehead. And in terms of thinking about uh, provision for rested people, that is a time when, um, when maybe that van would be useful rather than take those police officers off the street. And the second thing is that um, I hope that the arrangement that the police have with Butlins will continue where extra pot officers seem to be on the beat on a Saturday lunchtime. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed them, but they are there on a Saturday lunchtime when it's uh, certain weekends down at Butlins. Uh, I think that's very commendable and I think it's a good use of police resources. I, uh, I'm really appreciative of the, uh, of, of the kind comments. Of course, events like this, you see we've got colleagues uh, standing at the back uh, and, and, and sitting, sitting in the audience. There's a tendency for people to seize the opportunity on days like today to tell us what might be better or to tell us what your anxieties are about the future. And it's very nice just to, to hear people celebrate, um, certainly, and, and sustain me in my belief that we've got brilliant policing. Actually, I think we've got the best policing in the world in, uh, in, in the, the United Kingdom. And, um, and, and actually, people, you know, this force is full of people who come to work every day to do their best, to keep people safe, to talk to, you know, to, to, to look after people. Um, and I appreciate uh, you, you saying that. Uh, the second thing I'd say is I think from a social policy perspective, uh, and I don't want to sound like a sociologist, but actually it's, it's quite a good thing if we don't criminalise too many young people and if people are just being a bit daft and we can have a word with them and send them home rather than resorting to immediate arrest, which is very much the way in, in some city centres and the way they're policed, uh, that use of discretion and common sense. Uh, banking the advantage that we have with, 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 the, with the community here, uh, again, seems to me a very sensible thing. Um, I would say, as, as if we're talking about the powers that be, I guess that, among others, that probably means me. Uh, and, and yes, I, I hear your point, and, and we do understand that. Of course, it's not just Minehead, which is at its busiest uh, on a Friday and Saturday evening. That, that is when people tend to want to go out. But, um, you know, we're doing, uh, we're doing our best to ensure that the, the place our resources are placed reflects that uh, demand but thank you very much indeed for, for your kind comments yeah and just i suppose specifically the points you made about um our officers working with butlins absolutely the the strength of that relationship is really important we don't intend on changing anything we need to work really closely together so that uh, they act responsibly and do everything they can to keep this a safe area and then and we will respond and work with them to do that also so we're, we're not planning on taking anything away from that. Okay. A few more questions, this gentleman. Thank you. Run out of battery, have we? Yeah. I don't need a battery, I'm sure I speak quite well. Definitely <laughs> <laughs> not. Um, you know, you're talking about local communities have been involved with the local authorities. Uh, the Minehead Town Council, we've recently, over the last few months, had two presentations made to us for two schemes which actually assist the police in their performance of their duties. One being the provision of additional CCT, to CCTV cameras, and the other being the radios for a shop watch scheme. Now, my, whilst Minehead Town Council might be quite keen to support both of these, we have to account to the community for the way we spend our funds. And obviously, with the CCT television cameras, we've now been told there's additional works to the radio control room, so more funding is needed. Now, our problem is, as a local authority, we have to ask the question, what match funding comes? And we are told that no match funding is going to be available from the police force on both of these schemes. Now, I've picked up on the issue that you have additional funding now running. 
perhaps you could ask, tell us, can the local town council apply for two parts of the journey and apply for two grants from your <coughs> match funding schemes to assist in putting up some money towards these schemes? And perhaps on a political point of view, we're also told that the shops and the shop scheme, it would be unfair to ask them to contribute. Now, as a town councillor, I would say if they're benefiting by having these radios given to them, it is only right that they should perhaps do some match funding of, the, of their own as well. Mm -hmm. So, on a political basis, do you feel that it is right that shopkeepers who would benefit from this scheme should be asked to make some contribution prior to radios being given to them? As far as the radios, we've done some grant funding for some of the radios in some of, in, in some of the communities, and some of that has to be uh, match funded, so they will contribute something, and the community safety grant will contribute, uh, or the action fund will contribute as, as, as well to, to that. But th they are really viable, and, and, they, and they make a lot of sense, but everyone has to contribute to that. Regarding the second bite of the cherry, as you, uh, if, if, if I was Minehead Town Council, I'd bite at every cherry that was, that was going past, to be honest. Uh, and I think the way forward for that is to apply through the community safety grant through the community safety partnerships because certainly there has been funding and I think we've done some funding at Watch It for uh, CCTV as well so that it's through the community safety partnerships that you need to be able to put your bid in. Could I just, uh, just say uh, on, on the, the point about the police contributing um, it uh, it frustrates me that we get to the end of another financial year um, where, and it's a consequence of austerity, you know, people have, have attuned, they've tuned into the fact that times are hard and, and we are underspending. You know, people do underspend, they're inherently cautious, they're watching every penny. Um, and sometimes I've got to say, actually, let's, let's spend up to our budget. You know, we've been given this much money, um, let's spend up to that to, to make people safe. Um, and there are, you know, there are still victims of crime out there. It lets have fewer victims by spending our cash. We, I, as the as the chief said back in September, look, we're beginning to see a bit of an underspend. Let's look for worthy, sensible, necessary projects that we can fund from this year's underspend, where we can get the money out the door by the end of March. We looked again in January and asked the same question. And it's frustrating to think that there might have been worthy schemes that weren't identified that would have been appropriate and suitable. We'll try again next year because I guess we, we will see underspending again. It's the, it's, the, it's the way people behave in a time of, uh, of austerity. Um, but actually, you know, I, I'm very conscious in the constabulary forever saying to people, let's concentrate as much on the £275 million we will spend this year as on the however many million we've got to save. And we shall do the same again next year. So I'll push, and perhaps it's, you know, the, perhaps the fault lies with, uh, with me and with chief officers for not getting that message out sufficiently. But I think it's part of the modern reality of running a public service that at fixed intervals in the financial year, you stop and say, what might we do if we're making savings elsewhere to spend up to budget in order to provide a better service and keep people safe? So I'll, I'll take that back because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's slightly depressing to see a reasonably sizable underspend not offset by necessary spending that we could have done. Okay, Toby, yeah. I think we're going to take two more questions and then uh, we'll need to wrap it up. Hello. As a member of the local CCTV and uh, Avon and Somerset Police volunteer, I'd just like to remind um, our councillors that we do not get paid. It's lovely that we have our CCTV, but we do it for free. Thank and you. we appreciate it very much. <laughs> okay. okay, and then the gentleman in the pink jumper, and then that'll be, then that'll be it. Uh, as chairman of Watchit Town Council, I'd like to say thank you very much for letting us have the funding for us to soon be able to have our CCTV. It's something we've long aspired to, and hopefully it's going to help us an awful lot. Um, one of my questions would be, though, that um, recently we had a lot of problems in Watchit when the um, works were being done on the A39, with um, traffic coming through, which wasn't meant to come through. Um, there were police officers there on the, on the roads, and PCSOs were there. Unfortunately, people were still not taking any notice of them. We had a couple of incidents where there were fights broke out at the top of Cleve Hill because two police people couldn't get past each other. 
Could I just ask if you're going to collaborate with local people, come and ask us that live there to say, please, which way the traffic can come. Perhaps we could just have a one-way system to try and see two buses go up the, one of the narrowest streets that there are. It is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you make an absolutely uh, very valid point. The people that live and work in an area are the people that know how that area works and the roads work the best. So um, it's not just us that have responsibility and authority over that. We work really closely with local authority and highways. But you make a valid point and we'll, I'll make sure I feed that into all of our discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman in the um, maroon jumper. Thank you very much. <laughs> when my... <coughs> I'm glad I'm able to get in on one of my pet hobby horses, and that's police officers and PCSOs, and I'm familiar with both Bath, Cainsham, uh, as well as Minehead. Now, I accept there are many, many times when they should be patrolling in pairs, but 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning in Cainsham or in Bath is not the time. Now, I would accept that sometimes officers being tutored, but it's very nice to go around the streets of Bath or Cainsham, chatting away, and I'm sure that they're talking about crime trends, local criminals, and how, how <laughs> rather than what's on display at the local supermarkets and how cheap things are. Surely it's a case of basic supervision to stop officers and PCSOs patrolling in twos when it's not necessary. Spread your resources. The public will approach a single officer more readily than they will a pair. A pair of officers won't do very much. One on his own might. There's always hope. I think two in a car, actually, um, despite what it might seem, two officers in a car will probably produce more work than one on his own in the car. But please, get your sergeants and inspectors out there looking at these guys that are leaving the station, going out in pairs, day in and day out. It's a waste of your resources. I, I think I did mention something about this uh, in, in my earlier remarks, and I, and I, I, do, uh, I, I do agree with you, um, to the extent that we're, we're actually penalising our northeastern area and Bristol area by taking more officers off them than we are from Somerset because Somerset has been more effective at insisting on single patrolling rather than patrolling in pairs. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, our uh, local commanders will get that message. You know, necessity is, of course, uh, the mother of invention and the financial necessity that's been a, a consistent backdrop to, to our conversation this evening means we just can't afford it, let alone you know everything else that you describe. And I, I agree with every word you've said. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be pushing hard, and um, you know, people are realising. Uh, you know, people up and coming people who are after uh, after my job and Nikki's job in a few years' time, we're giving them some very clear messages about the way, you know, if you want to get promoted in this force, this is what you've got to do, this is the way you've got to behave, um, and making best use of resources and understanding the need for an efficient police force, as well as the things about, you know, fair treatment of people and integrity, they're all core to that, uh, core to that message, as is collaborative working. You know, and, and people who want to get on are beginning to hear that and are responding, and I hope that... Uh, I hope that we will see progress, but please do feel free to uh, to have a word yourself, or send me an email or a tweet. I agree with you. Okay. Remark that it's strength in numbers. Oh well, there you are. Well, that's not the uh, that's not what they're being told by me. Anyway, thank thank you, Nick, and uh, I'd like to say to thank you to the Chief Constable and to and to to Nikki, but most of all, a very big thank you to all of you because you know we can be a much better police service a much better police and crime commissioner because we have listened to you and i hope you found it useful for tonight but thank you for all coming out this evening thank you and thank you tim Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that, uh, I'm sorry you couldn't come to the, uh, that it was a good evening.
a good time. And, and if you want to fix up a time to come and do a tour, very happy to arrange, a, arrange that. So just contact, contact my office. I'm very happy to do that.